My talk is called Getting Lost in Community Building, uh, but I must confess that while I was developing it, I decided to rename it to Let's Get Lost Together. So I hope you will go with me on this journey. Uh, my name is Matt Turk, as Andy said, but uh, only part of this talk is going to be from my perspective. So shall we get started? Okay. So hi, I'm Matt. Uh, I'm going to try something new this time. I've never done this before. I started from scratch. And I'm not totally sure that it's going to work. But I'm going to try to do something new, because we should all try new things. Um, now that I mostly hang out with, instead of astronomers, which is where I got my PhD, but now I mostly hang out with librarians, storytellers, information scientists, and even interactive fiction scholars, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to try something new. A couple years ago, I wrote a paper called How to Scale a Code in the Human Dimension. Um, I'm going to click on that. It was on the archive. Um, yeah, let's go back. Andy suggested that uh, I give a talk about that paper, uh, and actually Andy suggested I give a talk leading up to that paper as well. He invited me to give a talk in 2012. Anyway, I don't get to see Andy as much uh, as I'd like to anymore, um, and times have also changed since I wrote that paper, so I thought I would revisit it, uh, particularly because I see it getting, getting cited by people. Um, when I was a graduate student, I actually gave a, I, I wrote a paper that had in the abstract, we saw this in one out of the five times that we, you know, ran our, our system. And then what this translated to over the following years was people interpreting that as it's exactly 20%. And so I thought that I would, in the spirit of correcting that, uh, take an opportunity to update that paper just a little bit. So uh, is everyone ready for the behumblement? <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go over here. So in the paper, uh, I gave a breakdown of some things about what I thought I knew about community building. And this came from the perspective of things like uh, scientific open source software, specifically from domains that maybe were in the physical sciences, maybe were a little bit behind the times at the time. Uh, and they were also based all on experiences that I'd had up to that point. Um, nowadays, I must confess, the recommendations seem a little bit pedestrian. Uh, and honestly, on reflection, I am growing rather tired of giving recommendations that focus on self-interest in, as a guiding principle instead of a moral good. I will confess that I have no patience for seeing people say you can improve your efficiency by doing something that also happens to be good instead of framing it the other way around, that you should do something good, and then you might see an improvement in efficiency. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, this is a hard thing to internalize because we all have our own self-interests. Uh, I'll pause there for everyone that's sick of this to, to exit. Um, <laughs> I'll talk about... I'm going to talk about the two different projects. Uh, the first one was Enzo, and the other one was called YT. Which one do you want to hear about first? Enzo. All right, let's do Enzo. So the first one was called Enzo. <laughs> I didn't create this, uh, but I really loved it. It was a great code. I learned C++ from it. Um, and you could make it simulate gas dynamics, and this sometimes happened to be astrophysical phenomena, like this one. Uh, this was made with uh, raw libpng, believe it or not. Um, this was a fun case, and it was a primary code. So people would use it to do their science. And I want to note that saying do your science is a little bit of a, an awkward construction. And it's one that we've been kind of saddled with, but I think is also kind of phony. Um, it was a code that people invested their time in and thought, this is what I'm going to do. And so my competitive advantage is embedded in this code. YT is the other code. Is it okay if I go on to YT, Anthony? Yes. Okay. You were the one that shouted, right? Okay. So YT was the other project that I talked about in this, and I was pretty sure it was pretty awesome. Um, again, times have changed. Uh, not only that, but I was pretty sure that what I was doing with YT was awesome. I mean, I, I don't want to pat myself on the back too hard because I've already broken both hands doing so. Um, 
YT, uh, YT is the project that brought me to SciPy for the first time back when it was called SciPy 2008. I don't know why we've changed the name. Um, those of you who were at Ralph's talk yesterday might recall him talking about the age of NumPy. Well, NumPy was very young then. In fact, I think that was right after I had personally changed a bunch of my C APIs over to, to NumPy from NumArray. Anyway, that's embarrassing. I should talk about that. But I remember sitting in the audience and seeing uh, Travis give a talk about the internal structure of D types and U functs and thinking, my goodness, this is exactly where I want it to be. It was totally what I wanted to see. I wanted to see the internals of all this stuff. In fact, I took a photo of it with a point and shoot camera that I then connected via USB to my uh, computer and then I uploaded to a website called uh, flickr.com. Um, and I, I labeled it something like, this is what I'm here for. Anyway, where were we? So, um, in the paper I made a couple observations and recommendations. I'm gonna, we, we, formally speaking, we could do either one first because this is nonlinear storytelling. I'm gonna go with observations first. So you gotta remember, 2013 was a different time, and also 2012, some of these things happened during the, the time between giving the talk and writing the paper. Um, Slack didn't come on the scene until the original glitch died. Uh, so yeah, I'm telling myself it's a different time. Slack didn't come on the scene until the original glitch died. Um, and I almost wrote, not the cool glitch, which is the glitch that, that is on now, then I realized they're both cool, and neither one is as cool as Game Never Ending, which ultimately led to Flickr.com. Um, glitch died, was, GitHub was obviously on its way to success, but had not utterly obliterated the competition, and I thought that for a while, when the credits rolled, the happy ending would last for a while. We'd all be chilling out with the Ewoks for the next 30 years, but no. Some of those observations have held up, and others have definitely not. So the implicit presumption of the paper was one that now feels really strange in this particular venue to, to say. And the assumption was that communities are good, and especially communities of practice. They can fix things. They will make your workload lighter. They'll open up new opportunities for research. They'll put together furniture kits. <laughs> and they can even make sure you never have spinach on your front teeth when you're on a Zoom call you might not know about. <laughs> Hold on, let's see if the footnote works. It says too soon. Okay, and how did they do this? The idea that I was trying to get across, uh, which was mostly to people that were resistant to, to ideas like this, um, that didn't want to engage with people outside of their research group was to align your interests with the interests of the other community members. All of a sudden, now we're all working towards the same goal, and so I can leverage all the stuff that you're doing so that I can get ahead. So based on this, I made a couple recommendations. And in that, I based them both on a particular recommendation that I want to unpack, which is you must design the community that you want. I think I even put this in bold in the paper. I've seen this show up in other people's talks, and I still kind of believe that, but I believe it really differently now. And in the paper I suggested you should build technical infrastructure to support communities and you should build social infrastructure to support communities. Any uh, requests on which of the uh, types of infrastructure? Again, nonlinear storytelling. Social. All right, let's do social. In the paper I recommended behaving with humility, respect, and trust. And these are things that to be perfectly honest, are easy to lose sight of, especially when you're no longer in the beginning phases of a community, but as you know, uh, was mentioned yesterday, oh, I was trying to indicate someone and I don't see, uh, you should do periodic check-ins. They're easy to lose sight of and things become more complicated. So humility, how do you respond to negative feedback? Do you get really resentful when somebody tells you that something doesn't work? Do you snap back at them? you tell people that they're just not understanding? Or do you respond with empathy and care? See, the way that I set that up, you're supposed to assume that the one that starts with or is the good one. <laughs> Laughter's really dying out. <laughs> so what is the tone that you set in your community? Is it the one where you think that nobody else is as good at you, at good at this as you are? Is it the one where you view everything as a transaction? And I want to Stop for a moment on that one because this is something that I've come increasingly to struggle against in myself and to recognize as something that uh, is, is potentially toxic in other situations. If you view everything as a transaction, then all of a sudden the value can, draw, can drop out of the bottom of a relationship. Is it one where you just want to hustle for the next milestone? Is it one where you just want to hustle for the next sale? 
Is it one where you want to hustle just for the next grant? Or is it one where you want to assume the best of people? And then lastly, how do you feel about the community in your project? Do they need you to help them at every single step of the way? Will they get lost without you? Are you the only one that can save them? Are you their Jedi Knight? <laughs> or is it time for the Jedi to end? See, we talked about The Last Jedi and how it was the best Star Wars movie over lunch, so. These are easy to lose sight of, especially as time goes on and things become more complicated. Stories don't just end, they keep going, people change, relationships change, and we have to be mindful of our relationships as this happens. So, technical infrastructure. Technology changes. There was a piece of tech mentioned in the paper that I no longer use that I still weep for. Anyway, the recommendations there, like use IRC and mailing list, those are pretty dated. Um, but the medium does impact the message. And so we do have to be careful even if the specifics change. The medium through which you communicate definitely impacts the message that you're, you're telling. It impacts the, the story that gets told of the community. And I also talked a bit about designing a community. And I'm going to return to this now uh, because it feels kind of gross to talk about designing a community. And it didn't feel gross at the time because I didn't really think about it. And it's not so much that intentionality is bad. It is absolutely not bad. I tweeted yesterday that I wanted to uh, force everyone that I know to watch Tanya Allred's talk. Tanya, uh, I, I'm Allred's talk. Um, it's more that it's obvious now that design is something that can't be imposed on a group of people or shouldn't be. Imposing a community or a design for a community on people means making decisions for them, which implicitly means asking them to assimilate. And that's inappropriate, and it's something that I didn't really recognize at the time. But assimilation is the opposite of fostering diversity in the sense that it spreads the discomfort to the people that have to assimilate instead of evenly distributing it. I'm sure there's a much more elegant and thoughtful way of saying this, and I look forward to, to hearing thoughts on that. But this is inappropriate, and the big one that people seem to take away, probably because it was in bold, uh, was a pretty strong one, which is that the application of a term user with its connotations results from self-assigned roles or perceptions of individual abilities. And I said that as peers, because we're all in the scientific research process together, this distinction is harmful between users and developers because we're occupying that gray area in the middle. And I still kind of believe this, but it also removes agency from both people involved in this. Maybe not everyone needs to be a developer. This was something I didn't really grasp and something I wish I could go back and explain to myself, uh, along with, of course, my now uh, somewhat tattered copy of Gray's Sports Almanac. Not everyone needs to engage at the same level. And like Tanya Alrod said yesterday, engagement is a function of privilege. Not everyone wants what I want, for instance. And most importantly, my experience is not necessarily replicable. And so all of this imposition of community standards, of community interactions, stem from this notion that an experience is replicable, and so there, there is a right way to do it. I thought it was all just a game that I could optimize. And more than that, I thought it was all a game I could optimize and win. Does anyone see where this is going? Carol does. Let's play a game of pretend. <laughs> so, let's say you're starting out a new project. What do you want to name your project? Ewok. Ewok. What do you want it to do? Blow up dead stars. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an astronomical kind of project. Anything <laughs> <laughs> managed to replicate the original. <laughs> uh oh. Looks like there's another project called Koei. Do you see what I did there? <laughs> oh, geez. Not only that, but it also blows up Death Stars. <laughs> what do you think? Should we just work on that one, or should we make our own thing instead? Work on that one. Work on that one? Nice try. <laughs> Yeah. So, you, uh, so we're working on Project Ewok, and uh, now we've got points and burnout. 
all right? Because those are the two only ways to measure the success of a project. <laughs> uh, you've been at this for eight weeks and one day. Um, that's a glitch, it's supposed to start at zero. Uh, let's figure out what we need to do. Should we register an organization on GitHub, GitLab, or should we self-host a GitWeb? GitWeb. Okay, so it won't be till we transition to the next one, but you'll note the burnout score goes way up. <laughs> Should we set up Gitter, Slack, or maybe an IRC channel? IRC. Let's do Gitter. <laughs> okay, and now, should we get to work? Nah. <laughs> There's only one bold item up there, Andy. Okay, so already we're starting out a little burnt out. Uh, and our community points are not that high, and we've only been at this for eight weeks and two days, and there's a ton of functionality to implement. So do we write code? Do we tell people about it? Uh, or could we fix bugs? Or should we use it? All right, let's write some code. That was really, really hard, and it seemed to be pretty useful. Okay, so we got some burnout, but the points only went up a little bit. All right. Okay, now what? Let's tell people about it. Oh, you just gave a terrible, terrible poster. <laughs> that really takes it out of you. So, what should we do now? Fix the bugs. Let's, fix the bugs. Let's fix some bugs, okay. Fixing bugs is really hard. You managed to solve two of them and it really, really took it out of you. Here, let's go back. I kinda wanna write some more code. <laughs> that was pretty straightforward and it also seemed to be pretty useful. Well, I, I'm gonna keep writing code. Ugh. That was useful, or useless. Okay, taxing but worthwhile. See, my community points are going up. All right, let's tell people about it. Oh, I just gave a sort of crummy lightning. Hmm, I feel seen. Um, my goodness, that really takes it out of you. Uh, let's do it again. Ooh, okay, lightning talk. And uh, let's fix some bugs. Ooh, it's really hard. It strained me a little bit. Let's fix some bugs. Okay, uh, should, uh, why don't we use the project? All right, I got a few more things done. That was kind of okay, right? Here, I'm gonna keep using it because now you know, I'm writing my thesis or something, right? Or a paper. Uh, oh, apparently I turned off the random. Anyway, uh, so why don't we call it a day now, right? We're tired, it's been 29 weeks. That number was supposed to go up a lot faster. Uh, it's time to call it a day. We've reached 57 community points. Congratulations. We have earned a spot on the Hall of Fame. Be sure to send that to your loved ones and tweet out flattering photos of yourself in front of it. But there's still more work to do. Let's move on. Here's the thing about what we've kind of been up to up here. And it's at this point that I worry that I should have set a timer so I knew what time it was. Uh, We've been measuring stuff in a really simplistic way, right? That was all for yucks. And not only simplistic, but also a really self-serving way too. This story was all written in the second person. And I have a question for you. Did you interpret it as the second person plural? Or did you interpret it as the second person singular? Okay. The thing that I lost sight of in that paper and uh, you know, you know, a lot of times since then, is that we're all the protagonists in our own stories. Isn't that fun? And while you're out making your project, everyone else is also making the same decisions and optimizations. I was the only one playing this because I didn't give you the URL to it, but you could have all been out there playing the game at the exact same time. And the thing is, unlike us all playing these things, you know, at the same time and them not interacting, in reality, this would be an MMORPG. And we, I don't know, have web sockets through Jupyter Hub. I don't know. Anyway, those are all words. Um, while you're out making the project, everyone else is also making the same decisions and the same optimizations. Now, with your permission, I'm going to switch back to the first person. And so that's the end of my talk. And I don't have a lot of takeaways, I guess. Uh, I got pretty into the idea of making it into a game. That really ate up a lot of time. Um, but in making it, I realized a couple really important things that I want to share with you, or at least things that I thought were important. I've made so many mistakes, just so many. Which, uh, and all the stuff I thought I knew or thought that I could do, I struggled to implement. And bad miss. So here's my takeaway that I, I hope is interesting to you. 
You, singular, are the protagonist in your story, but you, plural, are the protagonist of your community's story. So treat people with kindness and humility and respect, and listen to people who know what they're talking about, especially the other people in these sessions. I'm sorry, Andy. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to all the conference organizers and all of the other presenters who have said things that have really resonated and impacted me. I'm really grateful to be given this opportunity to talk to you all, and I'd especially like to thank the reviewer who pointed out all the issues with my abstract and gave me a nice behumblement that really fed into the structure of the talk. And thanks to the double unblind process, I actually do know who to thank. <laughs> thank you. Any questions? Awesome. I was really sweating that I'd have to ask one. <laughs> Pardon me. Yes. Yeah, so what What was the project you still weep for? I think we both know that answer, Sean. <laughs> it's yes. mercurial. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Oh, go on. Fun trivia fact: the place we had the first talk was a place called Isis, which was poorly named. But it has a C, right? Uh, not anymore. Thanks for walking all the way here. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm trying to form this as a question. But I, when working with communities, when you're thinking of equity and trying to make sure that everyone is treated fairly or everyone that's like volunteering for you, it's not just free labor, it is nice to think of it like a transaction just to make sure that what they're giving to you, they're getting something fair back and it's fair for all the different people that are coming. How do you relate that with like not seeing them as transactional, which I also like makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think the way that you phrased it is a really, uh, a really good way to think about it that I, I hadn't really thought about the fact that transa you know, like transactions have two people involved in them, right? And I guess from a, from a capitalistic perspective, you want to get more out of it than you give out, right? And I think that uh, letting go of that might be a good way. But honestly, I would ask you for your, your thoughts on that and how to, how to frame it. Nice song. Thank you. <laughs> so I have a question. In the original paper, you were really talking about how to like scale to like thousands of developers, right? And, oh yeah, uh, that worked out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious. You can't spell you... Jupiter without YT. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but as we find most of our communities survive on like 10 developers and you know, thousands, tens, thousands, even millions of users. Like, do you still think that scaling to thousands of developers even is possible or, or useful? I think that the utility that they would get out of it uh, for a single monolithic project would decrease considerably. And I think that uh, the model needs to be rethought in order to facilitate many people being scaled out on a single ecosystem, if you will. As, for instance, everybody in the SciPy ecosystem, you know, that could scale out, but not necessarily all on a single thing. But I don't know. I, I loved your storytelling. That was really awesome. I wanted to say, you know, just actually ap after that question too, you know, you might have 10, 20, 30 people who created this tool and millions of users. What's, can you talk about like maybe it's an ideal system that these users can somehow thank you? You know, I don't want to say exactly like a like button, right? Because then it gets a little bit into that social media metric obsession kind of thing. But mm -hmm. is, is there anything that pops into your mind that's just like a nice... So what I can, yeah. what I'll tell you is that the things that have meant the most to me have been when people have, when I've worked with people and I've been able to see the impact that it's had on them, and that's not necessarily scalable. You know, the whole point behind the the retweet button is that it's it fundamentally changes the scalability of of, of one person, right? I don't know, I don't know. Uh, but. The times that have meant the most to me, that have been really moving to me, have been uh, people that have utilized something and then and the, uh, I was able to identify playing a small role in that. But really it's about, you know, enabling their their own agency. So the way the value comes from unscalability. 
that was, that's kind of what I've come around to thinking, but. Arr. Citations. Yeah, citations. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> so I think particularly as a project scales up in the number of developers, I don't know, do you feel that there is a sort of a, a a balance to strike. So, so you mentioned the importance of, for example, a community being sort of non-assimilative. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also this sort of this, to me, what seems like an opposite notion of conceptual integrity, right? This project is designed with a purpose. And at what point, you know, do you think sort of, if there is a, you know, if there's sort of one person who is, you know, who is considered responsible for the conceptual integrity of a project, like where does that balance lie between sort of being a non-assimilative community and sort of maintaining some notion of conceptual integrity for a project? So I, I want to, and I think that I have a minute to answer this, but I want to break that down into two different notions. And one of the things that I was, I was trying to get at with the assimilation discussion was also about the notion that there are potentially uh, cultural norms or cultural knowledge or unseen things that, that may be off-putting to somebody. As an example, people might find Star Wars humor tedious or alienating. Um, I can't believe somebody said Ewok. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, the assimilation into the vision of a project is actually something that, that I've thought about a lot because I've uh, repeatedly been, been, or at least in my mind, shown to be wrong about visions for a project. We had, uh, for a number of years, uh, and, and uh, Nathan Goldbaum was a core developer on both Enzo and YT, and in many cases, I wanted to, I wanted to see things happen differently than they did, and I did not immediately realize that I had been wrong. And had we, and I think that that was something that really brought home the notion that the ownership and the agency of individual people that are working with or you know, operating on a project can't be, be forgotten because it fundamentally has to be about the agency of individuals to apply it. Then again, that may apply completely differently at a different scale of users, developers, and different uh, stakeholders and different means of, of engagement. Hey, Matt. Um, hey, Anthony. So thanks for the great talk. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious in terms of to hear your thoughts on designing a community and how you think of that now as in sort of negative terms versus what we see as like rules for engagement like codes of conduct and how you, oh. how you square those. Yeah, that's that's a really good point because when I was when I when I was trying to to talk about designing of a community, it was more about forcing um, uh, forcing norms from a set of acceptable paths. And I do think that that absolutely there needs to be a you know a, a base level of acceptable behaviors different than acceptable mechanisms. And I I absolutely think that a, a code of conduct is is completely necessary, and I, I guess that's a, a difference in phrasing that I would need to think about it to, to tease out where that falls, but um, no, I don't know. Thank you. I just had a, a quick comment about the, the question of maintaining coherence of a project, conceptual coherence as yeah. a project scales. Um, as long as, if you're starting a project in an existing ecosystem, uh, as the project scales, you get more users, and more users need more interoperability with other parts of the ecosystem. That need for interoperability can also can push itself towards coherence as you know APIs start getting simpler, more you know more orthogonal, and you know you might not have to worry about that. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> I should have made this talk longer. These questions are hard. <laughs> hey. Um, hey. Thanks, great talk. Uh, do you have any thoughts on governance and decision making um, in the context of what you just spoke about? Yeah, so governance and decision making were actually um, things that, it, the, the problems that we ran into were very different in terms of governance and decision making because the mechanism by which people interacted with something, the amount of time that they could spend on it, their value proposition for what they, what they thought of that they would get out, and there I am using you know, transactional language again, but the, the, the way that they thought of the relationship with the code were, was very different. Um, as an example, uh, the way that people interact with Enzo and the Enzo development, because it was a reasonably stable, long-lived thing, was very different. And uh, I 
tried to change it, but I didn't put enough wood behind the arrow, uh, and I didn't uh, engage enough with people, and so that ended up steering the project awry. With YT, people, it's a little bit more agile, but people also engage with it at a different level. They see it as a way to, um, you know, potentially, uh, some of the developers saw it as a way to potentially increase their visibility, as well as to get their, their you know, new development and, and so forth out. Yeah. So I think that in terms of governance, the thing that I have really tried to struggle with is the, that I, I've tried to, to think about is how much is too much of a, a burden, a cognitive burden on people to participate in versus how much is the cognitive burden of changing something without, you know, properly uh, inocu or whatever into the community, right, without, without yeah. And let's thank Matt for a great talk. <laughs>